his computer. Okay. Welcome back to the Career Dad Show, and I'm here with Frank Shankwitz. Frank, how are you? Oh, good, and thank you for the invite. I really appreciate it. No, thank you so much for spending some time with me. It's, it's evening here, but it's about noon with you. Is that right? Yeah, yes. We're in, uh, in the western part of the state. We're in Arizona, so western part of the United States. And I live up in the mountains in Arizona, so where the poor people in Phoenix are 115 degrees Fahrenheit, yeah. We're about 80 degrees up here because we're about 6,000 feet. So wow. quite a difference in elevation and terrain. Yeah, and, and that sounds a lot more pleasant <laughs> than 150. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so if people aren't familiar with the name uh, Frank Shankwitz, they'll probably be familiar with the organization that you founded, which was the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Um, yeah, yeah. And and also, as I, I watched it uh, last night until the early hours of this morning, Wishman, uh, which is a, a film on Netflix, which I, I have to admit, I cried several times throughout. Um, would you be uh, happy to just explain a little bit about your story, really, with, with getting involved with, with Make-A-Wish? Well, and, and I'm kind of give you the condensed version since we don't sure. have a lot of time. But uh, <laughs> it, it goes back to... Um, 1980 is when I started the foundation. Mm. And um, in the United States, <clears throat> excuse me, in the mid 70s, there was a very popular television show called Chips. And Chips was the adventures of the California Highway Patrol motorcycle officer, Ponch and John. Very mm. popular with the younger kids, uh, that seven age on up. And uh, we learned uh, from a friend that there was a seven year old boy named Chris that was in a hospital in Phoenix, Arizona. Unfortunately, Chris had terminal leukemia and only a couple weeks to live. And we were informed that Chris's favorite TV show was Chips. Her heroes were Ponch and John, the characters from the show. And he told his mother, when I grow up, I want to be a highway patrol motorcycle officer, just like Ponch and John. And I don't think I mentioned at that time, I was a motorcycle officer with the Arizona Highway Patrol. And the friends of the family asked, is there any way that he could come to the police headquarters, the state police headquarters, meet one of the motor officers, and I happened to be that motor officer they chose. Now, I'd never met this little boy. I had no mm. idea what to expect. But with the permission of his doctor, his mother, and our commanders, he was picked up by our state police helicopter at his hospital and flown to our headquarters building in Phoenix, where I was standing by with the motorcycle. Now, I, I said, I've never met this little boy. The door opens. I thought our paramedics were going to help him over to meet me. Instead, the door opens. This little guy jumps out, runs to the motorcycle. Hi, I'm Chris. Can I get on your motorcycle? Well, of course you can, Chris. Now, our equipment, our motorcycles were identical to what California Highway Patrol had. In fact, uh, we did our initial training with California Highway Patrol. So he knew every button and switch on that motorcycle. <laughs> this is the siren. Can I turn around? These are the red lights. What's in your saddlebag? just having the grandest time. And just to condense the story a little bit, uh, Chris became that day the first and only honorary Highway Patrol motorcycle officer in the history of the Highway Patrol. He was sworn in by our director. Uh, we had the next day a custom-made uniform made for him, issued his own badge, which is still assigned to him today. But most important to him, his motorcycle wings that we wear on our uniform, making him a full police motorcycle officer. And unfortunately, Chris passed away a couple of days after all this happened. The leukemia got to him. And our commanders learned that he was going to be buried in a little town called Kewanee, Illinois, which is northwest of Chicago, Illinois, about 180 miles. And came to me and said, we've lost a fellow officer. I want you and your partner to go back and give him a full police funeral, which we did. Now, again, this is 1980. This is the day before cell phones, internet. But the press, the TV stations in America were picking up our journey. And when we landed in Chicago, we were met by the major networks, the ABC, NBC, so on, uh, asking us about our mission, our story. But what they did was they notified Illinois State Police, the city police, the county police, all around this little town of Kewanee. And when we drove there, and we were met by them. We had no idea we were going to be met by all these police officers who helped give Chris a full police funeral. In fact, he was buried in his uniform and a grave marker reads, Chris Gracious, Arizona Trooper. But flying home to Arizona, I just started thinking about, here's a little boy who had a wish 
and we made it happen. Why can't we do that for other children? And that's when the idea of the Make-A-Wish Foundation was born. I mean, that's just such a beautiful story and with such a tragic ending, but you know, to be able to take such tragedy and mold that into something that has impacted tens of thousands of people and, and well, actually really hundreds of thousands with their families included as well. Yes, yes. And, and people say, oh, look what you did. Well, I, I had an idea of my work, but look at the people it takes around the world to make that work. Now, almost 40 years later, in fact, 40 years later, we have 63 chapters in the United States. We have 45 mm. international chapters on five continents. And you said hundreds of thousand wishes. We have now gone over a half a million wishes worldwide oh. just because of one little boy. Yeah. And, and one, one thing that I, that really stuck with me, and again, this was from on the film. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, about Wishman uh, was how true to life uh, Wishman is to your experience. <laughs> but one thing that stuck with me was you said, and I've heard you say this in some of your talks that I've seen on YouTube as well, that you've said, if I can do it, anybody can do it. And do you think that sometimes we get too caught up in, it's too hard to make a change, it's too hard to make a difference, where actually your message is, just make a small change to someone, one person, and that is worth it? Oh yeah, we, we, all, we all encounter that. We still, I still encounter that. But as a very young boy, 10 years old, 11 years old, fortunately I had a, a mentor, a father figure. One mm -hmm. of the things he taught me was those things that seem impossible, the negative things, learn how to make them positive, learn how to make them possible. People yeah. say, you can't do it. Well, why can't I do it? Uh, yeah. if, it if it's not illegal, <laughs> let's, find <laughs> yes. a way, let's find a way to do it. I mean, just work through everything. And, and look at success. It doesn't work all the time, but look at the success people can have if they kind of follow that same philosophy. Yeah, and, and I, I was speaking to someone earlier today who was saying that they were afraid to do something because they were afraid of failure. And, and my question back to them is, what is failure? Because if it is trying something and getting it, and getting it wrong and then trying again, isn't that just learning? Isn't that just part of a journey? As opposed to, for me, failure is just not trying, just saying, I, I, I can't do this. And I just wondered where, how do you, how do you think about failure or, or, or do you not? Well, you just keep doing it till you get it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But even with the Make-A-Wish Foundation, when I started this, in the state of Arizona, you had to have five people on a board to yeah. uh, apply for your uh, nonprofit status in, in America. And I went to the people that were involved with Chris. Here's my idea. Everybody turned me down. They said, this is not going to work. We've never heard of anything like this. Yeah. And I got very really discouraged. But again, as I taught a young boy, learn to throw those negative self positive. And it took me six months to find the like-minded people that helped put together this whole foundation. And once we did get it, boom. I mean, it, nobody in the world had heard of anything like this, especially started in the United States. And we just blossomed immediately, immediately. Yeah, yeah. and that's really interesting because um, obviously Make-A-Wish is a, is a non-profit um, and my understanding is that you never, you've never taken any money out of it. You, you have, um, you know, you have always not, not salary, you know, and your, your take on that is that, well, you were, and this is the thing I struggle to get my head around. You were still a police officer whilst do, and you just got a promotion. So you were now a detective and you thought, I want to build this organization, what we'd call today a side hustle. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> How, how did you do that? And exactly that. Like just okay. what you said, a side hustle. Because being a police officer starting this, you know there might be, even back then, what's this guy up to? What's he trying to do to make extra yeah. money? Yes. And I based the foundation on integrity and character. But the biggest thing was transparency and accountability. Hmm. And people say, why didn't you take a salary? And that's okay yeah. to do the nonprofit. But I say, I had a job. Yeah. Now, my, my big issue was trying to do two things. I couldn't do yes. both. But accountability, I said, any time you want to look at the books, the newspapers, whoever, here it is. You look at mm. the book. And yes, I never took a salary. In fact, I worked a lot of extra jobs to put money into the foundation when we first started it. Wow. And then later on, when we did, we had to hire somebody smarter than us. You can learn that in your university and that. Surround yourself with people smarter than you. 
And we uh, dawned us we have to hire somebody in the nonprofit world to run this foundation to make it grow and grow, which they've done to make it grow today. But they kept me on, Make-A-Wish Foundation kept me on what they call a wish ambassador, so I mean, literally all over the United States, parts of the world, for the meet and greets, the keynote speeches, just to help promote the foundation. And even then, I didn't take expenses. Mm. Now, we would get donated miles that would cover our airfare, uh, hotels would donate the rooms. But meals and that, my wife and I would grab a bag of jerky or something. We couldn't <laughs> afford the meals in this high hotels. And, and I never requested, because I could have requested travel reimbursement, expenses. Yes. But I never did, because that's taking money away from the children. Yeah. And how, I think, I think this just really solidifies your character in, in, it would have been very, especially as it grew, it would have been very easy to take probably a very nice living salary from Make-A-Wish. Oh, yes, yes. The current CEO uh, makes a little over a million dollars a year. Yeah. And, and people criticize that and say, why is he getting that much money, a million dollars a year? And I'm going to defend that. Number one, the CEOs over there have done nothing but make the foundation grow. Mm. But it's a worldwide organization. If he was in a nonprofit business and look, have offices all over the world with 100,000 employees, what would his salary be? Yeah. Seven, nine, ten million dollars. Yeah. So one million dollars for the responsibility the gentleman has is yeah. very low. And he also maintains in the United States what they have a four star rating, three star rating, be a charity navigator which right. rates a nonprofit, where's the money going? And he's been able to maintain the CEOs over the year that three and four star rating, which is a very good in the nonprofit world. Yeah, no, that, that's fantastic. I, I just think one, as someone who also has a full-time job and trying to build career dad on the side, I, I kind of like to think I understand your mentality of where you, you went through, but you know, being a law enforcement officer and and building such a large nonprofit. I know it, you know everything starts small, but I just think it's so incredible um, that that what you've done. And before you did make a wish, and before you were um, an Arizona uh, trooper, you were in the Air Force, I believe. Yes, I was in the Air Force, and I was stationed of all places in England. <laughs> well, we were lucky to have you. <laughs> Well, and, and this is not, I was uh, 1962 to 1965, mm -hmm. and I'm a big, a big buff of, of World War II history, the European theater, the uh, Pacific theater, and studied Winston Churchill all through high school, and then to be assigned to England, and that's not that many years after World War II. You sure. You're still in a rebuilding process, but to visit all the historical sites, the war sites, plus the history of your country, my God, just fantastic. And I was stationed, if anybody knows the area, uh, REF Upper Hayford and REF uh, Greenham Common. And uh, we would get every 15 days, we would get a three day pass where we could go into London. So <laughs> and I would go into London when I could, but just explored the whole country. Just, just loved it yeah. over there. And I've been back a couple times with my wife just to show around and hopefully another trip coming soon when this COVID thing is over. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, if you if you, if you are coming to because I I live just outside of London, so next time that you're coming over this way, I would definitely like to buy you a scotch. Oh, <laughs> yeah, what a great country! What a history! I mean, unbelievable yeah. history. The, the the thing that I found, so I I I've spent probably about six or seven months in the U.S. Uh, over two different uh, time periods, and I think the thing that I found is that England, um, we see distance. As, as quite a grand thing, but time not so much as in, oh, that was 200 years old, oh, okay. And it's the exact opposite. You know, I stayed with family uh, who lived in Ohio who said, do you want to drive to Niagara Falls today? And I'm thinking today, <laughs> like that's, that's, that's another country near enough. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. And you, you mentioned Churchill. Am I also right in thinking that you were part of Churchill's funeral procession? Yes, when I was stationed in RAF Upper Hayford, I was part of what they call the base honor guard. We were kind of the elite. We were all these the ceremony, the spit and polish guys. And when Sir Winchell Church passed away, uh, I was asked to be on part of his honor guard, the last leg of the funeral to his burial site. And like I said, I studied him in history. I admired the history of the man. And we're supposed to be at attention and everything. And as the procession went by, 
I've got a tear in my eye. <laughs> mm. just, I can't wipe it down. We're out of tension. <laughs> just what an honor. What an honor to be included on that gentleman's uh, funeral procession. Yeah. And I mean, I, I was going to say, what did that mean to you from, because you, you strike me as someone that, that has a lot of pride and i don't mean that in a in a negative way i mean that you take great care in what you do and you're you're quite thoughtful in your in your actions and you know but you described it so so wonderfully there that you know i i, I can imagine the image of the tear rolling down but you know you will not break that stance to be able to you know on yeah um and so then you came back to the states uh and then was it pretty much straight away you you kind of left the um, Air Force and then went into policing. Was that a natural step for you to go into policing? Well, there, there was a seven year gap. I went into okay. Motorola, uh, what a big, um, what I would say, industry in the Phoenix area. And what they were looking for was people that had top secret clearances. Uh, because we're Vietnam era, I was not in Vietnam, but we're Vietnam mm. era. I did have a top secret clearance because this was development of the Atlas Missile Program. Uh, not for interclassic, but for the space race. And uh, even though I didn't have a degree, they were looking for that and they were going to send us to college. And when you have a military background, you can also use what they call a GI Bill to help pay for your college courses. So between mm -hmm. Motorola and that, I did go to work for Motorola for seven years. Excellent job. I was a statistical engineer of all things. My math teachers in high school cracked up at that one. <laughs> We're trying to determine the failure rate, the probability of failure of certain components for the Atlas Missile Program. Oh, wow. But during that time, I, I liked the job. I mean, they treated us so good, um, but very bored. I, I'm not the big city guy. I didn't like living in the city. And several of my friends had joined the Arizona Highway Patrol and kept saying, with your background military, your engineering, uh, you'd be a perfect fit. And I said, guys, I make a salary one week what you make <laughs> in a month. Yeah. And I'm not going to give that up. But just on a whim, I did put in an application and was accepted and joined the uh, Ohio Patrol in 1972. Probably the greatest career move I ever made because 42 years later, I finally retired. <laughs> yeah. And see, there is something that I find so fascinating because I wanted to ask taking such a pay cut it I, I i hear this time and time again that you know people who say uh i don't like my job and i know that i want to try something else but it pays less and so they won't do it and they might be talking about it pays ten thousand dollars or ten thousand pounds less but it sounds like that you went to something that paid a lot less but what was your your level of happiness and enjoyment in in making that move over and was it worth it? Oh, definitely worth it. I mean, obviously, we never got the salary I would have made in, in the private sector. Sure. Um, but during the Air Force, my, my title was Air Police and actually got into actual police work and really mm. enjoyed that. And the more I thought about it and thought about it and, and taken that pay cut, but I had made enough savings where I figured I could live on these savings for two to three years. Wow. And, but the biggest thing was, I, I guess my whole life had been to help other people. Yes. And, and as a service type person. And the more I thought about that, I think I want to do this. Mm. Where, where do you think that comes from, that wanting to serve other people? Because, you know, you obviously see it through Make-A-Wish, but you're right. You'll see it through the service and the police and the service through the Air Force. So where, where does that come from, do you think? I, th I think it came from my childhood. And just very briefly, we showed in the movie, um, um, very rough childhood. Yeah. Uh, my, my mother abandoned me when I was two. At uh, six years old, a lady grabbed me off a playground. I had no idea who she was. I'm your mother. Uh, took me away from my father. And then up until high school years, it was a survival. And especially at 10 years old, we finally ended up in this little town in northern Arizona. And a and we were living in tents. We were living in the car. This is before the days of welfare, food stamps, everything else. It was just a bad existence, a rough existence. But when we ended up this one little town finally, at 10 years old, I got a job as a dishwasher working full time. But this little town of 500 people, it's the first time we lived in a town. It's the first time I had friends, the first time I had a school I could stay in. Hmm. I'd mentioned this, and we featured in the movie a gentleman, Mexican gentleman named Juan Del Bedillo, became my father figure, became my mentor but started teaching me work ethic, character, integrity. Integrity and character are, are not 
are not inherited. Those are developed to, and all through your life. Yeah. And he taught me that. But the biggest thing he taught me was so many people were trying to help us in this little town, uh, providing food when they could and that. And Frank, when you can give back, what do you mean, Juan, give back? We don't have a thing. The poor people <laughs> helping us. Yeah. And he said, he said, you don't have to have money to give back. You can give back your time. And he gave an example. Look at the widow Sanchez. She's always trying to help you out, bringing you some beans and tortillas. Look at her front yard. It's a mess. It's full of weeds. Look at her porch. It needs sanded. It needs painted. You can do that. Mm. And that's giving back your time. And I've tried to remember that. And all through my, my youth, my teen years and so on, um, so many people helping out, teachers, coaches, everybody else. And the give back thing to them, they're helping me. I wanted to be the best I could to show appreciation. The football team, what, whatever it might be. Yeah. And 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 you're right. And I think that if 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 you know if anyone listening to this hasn't seen Wishman, you just absolutely have to. It's it's a fantastic, a fantastic film. Um and as you say, from the outset, it looks like from the age of 10 or 11, you didn't have your, your mother or your father around and you were in a way adopted by this mentor, as you say. And, and how, you know, I, from my understanding is that you, you know, you reconnected both with your, both your mum and your, and your dad later in life. And, you know, was, was that incredibly difficult or had you, had you developed such a sense of, giving back that you just saw that as another way to to give back to them well the, the big example and with, now remember the movie is based on a true story <laughs> uh, yes yes and you asked that earlier yeah uh, hollywood likes to embellish a lot so it's based <laughs> on a true story we kind of embellish something and i'll let you i'll get back with that later but the biggest thing about reconnecting with my mother is juan told me uh, you may not have a close relationship but she is your mother and yeah. you will show respect. And, and that's something I've always learned, not just her, but also adults, authority, and so on. You will respect authority. Yeah. So when we did reconnect, yes, I respect her. We never had that close relationship, but yeah. I did respect her, I helped her out as much as I could. And she yeah. lived to be 90. And this woman that was, was very bitter towards life, as she gets in her 60s, she became a volunteer. She was helping the veterans. She was helping what they call crisis nursery, the babies that are born addicted to crack cocaine and so on. Yeah. So she, yeah, she became very involved in the community in her later years. Wow. Yeah. That, I mean, and again, so, such from, from the outset, such tragedy that had to happen in your life. But did, the thing that I'm always fascinated by is when a good things, when a good thing happens, and behind that good thing is a history of bad things. Are the bad things worth it to make the good thing happen? And, you know, I, I, is that something that you think about with your own life? Or, or would, would you just, it is, it is what it is and you're just doing the best that you can for others? It's basically it is what it is. I yeah. mean, we all have, it's not all little puppies and lollipops. On <laughs> There's all oh. sort of hiccups. We all have these issues. It's how you handle it. And yeah. again, my mentors are going to the highway patrol, through my teachers, through even my service years, highway patrol years. It's how you handle those issues. Yeah. And again, try to turn those negatives to the positive. It's a learning experience. We all need yeah. that learning experience. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, move, moving into a, a slightly different uh, tangent, I think as well, you also have been awarded the President's Call to Service Award. Is that right? <laughs> yes, I have, both from President Bush and President, current President Trump. And wow. Put an honor on that. And that's, that's um, because of my years and years of helping developing nonprofits. But like right now, I'm sitting on uh, eight different nonprofit boards around the United States, developing these boards mm. uh, for various different uh, causes that we're doing. But was recognized by those two presidents and very... <laughs> it's humbling it's an honor it's embarrassing but flattering <laughs> <laughs> yeah and 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 um what what does that entail like does that and so and when you received it from president trump as well was that pre-covid yes that was pre-covid okay. and, and okay. in fact it was just uh late last year in 2019 okay. now that's not a ceremony i attend at the white okay. house that'd be kind of fun 
Yeah. But send you this official letter and everything. And what I like is the official lapel pin from the White House, from the president. So yeah. I kind of like wearing that on my coat. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I don't think I'd take it off if, that, <laughs> if, I, if I had one of those. Um, and then just moving on to your, your own kind of personal life now, you have uh, two daughters, I believe. I think you've got three grandchildren and potentially a great grandson as well. Yeah, and you mentioned Ohio. My, all my children and grandchildren uh, live in Columbus, Ohio area. Oh, really? And, yeah. And uh, two daughters, uh, three grandchildren, uh, two boys, one girl, and a great grandson who's now nine years old. Wow. And my oldest grandson, who is 25, just informed me that we've got two uh, little girl twins on the way. <laughs> oh, amazing. Congratulations. So Christmas is going to get very expensive. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and how, you know, your childhood was incredibly different to mine. Um, you know, the, the only s similarities were my parents divorced when I was eight. I grew up with my mum. Um, but I still had my dad kind of in my life at, at, at week, you know, every other weekend. But that that experience for me meant that when I was even a really young kid, preteen, I knew that I wanted to one day have a family, that I wanted to create this stable home, and I wanted to have my own kids, and that I wanted to keep us together because I didn't really have that. Um, and, you know, now I've got a six-year-old son and a one-year-old daughter. I, I married my university girlfriend. It's cut so far, thankfully, it's all kind of worked out. But that was really imprinted in, in the back of my head. And I just wondered, did the experience that you had, was that similar for you? Or were you, because the film, you know, and I know we talked about, you know, artistic license, but the film portrays you at the start, particularly as kind of a bit of a, a loner, maverick, you know, just wanting to be by yourself and do your own thing. And I just wondered how important family, you having your own family was to you before you had one. Yeah, and the part of the film where we go into in my life, um, and I had just uh, come off a divorce myself. Right. I had these two little girls, and I, I did to answer your question. I didn't want those girls to experience what I went through. Now, any child goes through the traumatic thing about parents divorcing. Yeah. But I wanted to make sure, and that's why the, the ex-wife moved them to Ohio. Hmm. So I did everything I could to stay not only in touch with them, but make sure in the summer times they would come out with me um, and, and just have that still family unit. Uh, yeah. I didn't want to show any animosity towards my ex-wife. Yeah. Talking to them, and they're little girls. They're only 11 and 9. Hmm. And what a great mother year was. Look at what she did, what she accomplished in my, her whole life. Now they're in their, their late 40s, these girls, but I'd never say anything negative about their mother. Yeah. I was complimenting about what she did to help raise them and so on. And then also trying to work uh, part-time jobs that would come and visit from Ohio. Airfares were expensive. Mm. But I just wanted them to enjoy their time with dad. Yeah. And I got the greatest compliment several years ago from them. They said, dad, I don't know how you did it. Yeah. And, you know, they're now adults the same. That you think, wow, I think I did something right. So, yeah, uh, but, absolutely. Yeah. Never. I learned never make it about personally. You make sure you focus on those children. Yeah. And I think that's really, really important. Um, I'm I'm think so. My understanding as well with with Wishman is that that came about because you were asked if you could make a wish what would your wish be? And it would be to tell your story. Have, have I got that bit right? Well, somewhat. I was uh, okay. filming, a, filming a documentary in San Diego uh, called Stickability. And mm -hmm. part of my thing was my role on there. I was up on a stage giving my presentation like I normally do. And the reaction afterwards, I mean, the standing ovation just it wouldn't stop. And the host, <laughs> and not complaining about that. <laughs> yeah. But the, the MC of the event came up to me and I, afterwards, and we're done filming in front of the audience, I said, Frank, what's your wish? I said, what do you mean my wish? I, it's not about me, it's about the children. He hmm. said, no, if you need another horse, a pickup truck, what would something you would really like to have? And I said, well, I just like that my story told. So my kids, my grandkids thought that maybe dad did something cool in his life and yeah. dropped it at that. And then after the filming, the director of that, stickability documentary came backstage and said 
I've never seen an audience reaction like that in my life. And I want to do a story about your life. And I thought he's talking about a documentary, but I said, no, you don't. He said, yes, I do. And he yeah. said, no, I'm going to make a feature film about your life. And especially, and I just had a book come out that he read also. And he said, I want to focus on your years from 10 years old to when you started the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And that's how it came about. But the biggest thing was I've been involved with Hollywood before. And I said, we will do this. But I, in my contract, I want complete script approval. Because as we said earlier, Hollywood embellishes. Yes. <laughs> so I wanted to make, and that's why it took two and a half years to write the screenplay. By the way, the director was Theo Davies, and he also wrote the, the uh, original screenplay, and he is from England. Oh, wow. And part of my thing was a consulting producer, technical advisor, location scout. But as technical advisor, I had to translate to the crew what he meant, because he was speaking the Queen's <laughs> English, not American. So when he said, we're going to put it in the boot, I'd explain what that meant. You know, not the cowboy <laughs> boot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's so but, but in answer to your earlier question, how much of the movie is factual? Yeah. About 70% is actual factual. Wow. You know, the movie. And we try to do that. We try to keep it. But again, you've got to embellish some things. Some yeah, things. absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and as well, you know, there's, it, it's a recreation of your memory of the situation. So unless we could kind of plug you into a machine and download that raw data, that's going to, you have to allow for that, I think. Um, so we're so fortunate. Uh, this movie was released last year, 2019. Yeah. Um, but we've received several awards, but the biggest thing is that we qualify for Academy Award for Best Picture nomination. Wow. For a small budget independent movie that we were with the big boys. What a what an honor to the cast and crew to put this movie together. Yeah. It was and it and it was. I mean, I, I'm I'm definitely no film critic, but it was not only an enjoyable story, but a very well shot movie. It was, you know, just just under two hours. I, I highly, highly recommend uh people listening to it to go and give it a look on, on Netflix uh, immediately. Um, yeah, and Netflix just extended for another year. We only were supposed to run six months and they extended for another year. Wow. And do I have time for a quick story of during filming? Sure. Absolutely. Um, I, I, like I said, I was a consultant producer, technical advisor, and every day on the set, myself and the, what they call a script supervisor are usually the first ones on the set. We're looking at the, the uh, screenplay for the day. We're looking at continuity, the set designs, costume. So when cast and crew get there, everything is ready to go. And a script supervisor, a lovely young girl named Kenny Del Toro, and she knew who I was. She knew what the movie was about. Uh, we became friends. But about the third day in, I come in there. Kennedy grabs me, hugs me, and starts crying. And I mean, not just little tears, but almost crocodile tears. Yeah. Kennedy, what's wrong? What's happened? I'm a wish child. I mean, oh. it just, now I'm crying. We told the story a little later. The whole crew is crying. The cast is crying. When she was very young, 11 years old, she had a wish to go to Hollywood to learn how to be an actor. She was too ill to go. In fact, they thought she wasn't going to survive. She yeah. turned 17. She went into remission on this illness. And the chapter in New Mexico said, you still want to go? Yes, I do. She goes to the film school for acting. But during that time, she got very interested in the other side of the camera, the technical side. And a director, one of the instructors said, would you like to be an intern for the rest of the year? Yes, I would. And he put her as all things a script supervisor. And halfway <laughs> through the year, the regular script supervisor didn't show up for a couple of days during filming. And he said, she's fired, you're hired. This young lady is all over the world on sets, just having the greatest living. Wow. I wish child. So almost coming this full circle. Yeah. <laughs> that is and and that's a fantastic story. And and it just makes me think how many which children have you met? And also, how many do you think you haven't met? You've just brushed by in an airport or something like that. <laughs> well, and I've, I've met literally hundreds and hundreds of my speaking engagements. Yeah. Uh, my, my meet and greets, I'm boasting a little bit, are usually a two to two and a half hours. Not because I'm the, maybe the best speaker. Well, I was a Forbes number one speaker a couple of years ago. Amazing. Speaker. But people will come up and just want to talk. But I meet so many people. I'm the mother, father, grandfather, brother, sister of a wish child. Hmm. But more important is I, they come up, I'm a wish child. who are yeah. now an adult. And when I get that and, and I ask them, what was your wish? 
and I look into their eyes because I can see them relive whatever it might be. Yeah. But in airports, the same thing. Uh, there's so many airlines that sponsor wishes. The kids are wearing a T-shirt. Uh, I'm yeah. a wish child. And I just go up and say hi to the family and that and just hope you have a good time. And yeah, it's just so much fun. That's, that's, oh, you must be kind of walking on air all the time, know, knowing that something that, because I'm fascinated by the whole ripple effect and by how, you know, how something easily couldn't have happened. You could have been ill the day that, 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 that Chris, you know, needed to come and, and sit on your, mo- there are so many things that could have happened to make make a wish not happen but everything just happened at the right time and everyone was in the right place and now this wonderful amazing things happened and to know that you are the the start of that must just be amazing well like i said i had an idea to make it work but yeah hundreds of people for sure around the world to make it work now you talk about the ripple effect which is so funny if it wasn't for the television show chips back in the yes. 70s this would have never happened yes and, and and I met, I got to meet one of the actors, uh, Larry Wilcox, from the TV show Chips, several years ago. And he agreed to do, in fact, a cameo in the movie. <laughs> look in there. And then another actor, Robert Pine, who plays my sergeant in the movie. And he was also in a Chip Sergeant for Trevor. Yeah. But again, if it wasn't for those two characters, this would have never happened. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I was speaking to my wife earlier, uh, saying, you know, that you and I were going to have this conversation. And I was thinking, if I if I wouldn't have spoken to this gentleman, Paul, who then introduced me to Eric, who then introduced me to you, like, it's just, it, those things could have easily not happened. But it's, um, yeah, I just, I, I, for me, I think this is why it's so important to just be open and, and say yes to as many things as you can. I kind of like to think God's up there kind of moving us around <laughs> like a chess board. All little chess pieces. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we're all meant to be doing what we're meant to be doing. We've all got our parts to play. Um, one, one question that I wanted to ask you, and I, I kind of hope you haven't been asked before, but I, uh, if you have, that's fine, is, is what, if you could gra- grant a wish to 10 or 11-year-old Frank, what would that be? Oh, a family? Yeah a family unit a mom and dad together yeah. and like we've been showing a movie my mother abandoned me when i was uh, 12 years old so yeah but again uh i think it made me a better person i could have yeah. gone could have gone the bad way i mean there's so many kids this happens to yes. hundreds of thousands of kids around the world this happens to but again yeah. it was just that that small town the people that just helped me yeah and i'm all grateful community. for that always great uh we mentioned the juan delgadillo in the movie this is my mentor yes. in this town of seligman uh, he passed away we remained friends until he passed away about 10 years ago but i'm very close to his family that still mm-hmm. love in this little town and in fact when we filmed in this little town i made sure they were there um and there's only three real names in the movie in the wish man movie me my wife kitty and juan delgadillo because i wanted to honor him but yeah. when we had a big hollywood premiere the red carpet and everything, you know, the lights and so on. Yeah. I made sure I invited that family to walk the red carpet with me. Brilliant. That's that's lovely. And and it's one of the questions that I had for you that I didn't ask because you kind of already answered it was around exactly that, that at you know, 10, 11, 12, you could have easily gone down a different path of so much resentment, so much bitterness, and to almost turn your back on the world, but you just went in such a different direction. And I just think that's, you know, there's something that's, I don't want to say it's not normal, but there's, there's something within that allows that to, to happen, I think. Well, that, and again, this little town, and you've heard the, the expression, it takes a village to raise a child. Yes. This yeah. little town of 500 people. Uh, there's no way I could get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I got 500 people looking out for me. But again, because of the school and also one got I've never played any type of sports hmm. and got me involved with sports, with basketball, with football, I got me involved with music, uh, just so many things that yeah. uh, was too busy to get in trouble. And plus, I'm still having to work full time. I'm, I'm yeah. still a dishwasher during that because I had to pay room and board Yeah. during this period. But again, this negative positive, uh, I had to pay $20 a week room and board. 
and the greatest thing, because all of a sudden I got my own room that had a television set, the first television set in this little town. Yeah. And Juan said, you make $26 a week. Now, the positive thing is for the first time in your life, you're going to have six extra dollars a week. Now, back in the early 50s, that was a lot of money. Yeah. That was a lot of money. You know, movie cost 10 cents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and this, said, and this is a child. Positive. That's the positive. For the first time, you're going to have your own money. Because every money I've made went straight to my mother during that time. Yeah. 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 But again, it's just the people, the people. And they respected me, but the biggest thing I always like to say, if, if they respect you, you show respect to them also. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, th I think I'm now getting an understanding of this work ethic of being uh, in the Arizona police force and starting a, a nonprofit and working extra jobs to fund your nonprofit. That's all you'd known from a child. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Um, one of the final questions that I wanted to ask you is, is around uh, patience, because a lot of people who I speak to, especially with what's happening with, with COVID right now, you know, plans that people made are out the window. They're not able to do things that they want to do. And um, I find I speak to people who are almost wishing the time away for the COVID to be over, which I, I understand, but I just... I wondered what your take on that situation was, you know, how, one, I guess, how are you finding, um, you know, COVID and, and, and lockdown, but two, how do you, how do you, do you think that we're all impatient? Do you think we need to learn a bit of, yeah, patience? That's so hard to answer. I mean, it, okay. it, it's so many different things all over the world, all throughout the United States, different philosophies, why yeah. it's going, why it isn't. Uh, I, I live, in, in the county in Arizona that I live in, the county itself is bigger than the whole state of Massachusetts. Think about wow. that, this county. And yet we only wow. have 350,000 people that live in this whole county. So again, picture only 250,000 people in the whole state of Massachusetts. Yeah. Very small little towns scattered all over in the mountains. And um, we don't have much of an issue with the COVID. Yeah. Where we're, but we still, and down in, like, say, the Phoenix area, the big area where there's 4 million people, they do have a big issue. And no matter what you believe, I, if they ask me to wear a mask, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I will wear a mask. Yeah. Um, do I believe it or not? Who cares whether my opinion is on that? <laughs> yeah. Everybody has their own thing. Yeah. But I'll just follow the guidelines. It has affected me financially because my speaking engagements uh, that were all scheduled through the end of the year, starting yeah. last March, have all been canceled. So yeah. a big financial hit with me here. But <laughs> I've been on the road for six years, promoting movie, making movie, doing other things, speaking engagements. And it gave me time finally to settle down. This ranch is kind of big. Mm. I need to catch up on everything. So that took a lot of time. But now doing like you, inviting me, just again, appreciate inviting me to speak to you. I do three to four of these a week. And then also I'm in the development of two possible new television series. Wow. That the network have contacted me and one of them asked me to develop the show for me to host. So that's keeping me busy every day working on that. So that's, that's fantastic. fantastic. Yeah, and, and, and you know, because uh, my penultimate question was going to be, what's next for you? What, what are you looking at now? But it sounds like these TV shows. Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, we're calling the deck. And again, these networks have, have contacted us, develop a show um, that you can be a host on and then give everything to us and let's see if we like it or not. So it's mm -hmm. a, a pie in the sky dream, but it's something they contacted us. That's the big thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And we're working on this thing and the working title right now is called Wishman, which is my nickname, yeah. Wishman Angel Patrol. Nice. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> it's reality TV series. It's it's real quick. It's around the United States. We have so many disasters, fire, hurricanes, tornadoes, whatever it might be. We have veterans. We have homeless people that need help. And I've got my six angels that work for me. They're scattered all over the United States. They find a veteran that needs help. They find a town that needs help is devastated by a hurricane, tornado. They come to me, uh, wish man, Frank, we need to go and help these people to give yeah. back and we get a whole group of force people going in their carpenters, lumber companies, whatever it might be, and go and rebuild that community, build whatever it helps for a veteran, a homeless person, a police officer, fire, whoever. 
a child. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and that's that's the concept. And that right now, wonderful. Yeah, it's going to be fun. We're just shipping it out now for potential sponsors, and uh, we hope to start filming if it goes the first of next year. Wow, that sounds wonderful. And I think with so much, or there's a potential to see so much negativity in the world, either with political unrest, with COVID, with, yeah, you know, I think that'd be a really nice thing to put out there to spread some positivity. Yeah, and again, the theme of the show is everyone can be a hero, which is yeah. the theme of my movie, everything else, when you can help somebody out. So we're going to get the communities together to help somebody out. And yeah. we need that right now, not just here, but all over the world. Let's Absolutely. Help. Completely agree. The The last question that I wanted to, to ask you was, um, is we, we have some people who listen to, the majority of people who listen to the show are uh, parents, most of them dads. However, we do have some who are expecting parents or some people who I say are just putting in the work now. They know they want a family in the future and they're just listening to see what we end up talking about. And I always like to ask, what is the one piece of parenting advice that either that you try to live by or that you would you would give to others? I don't know if I'm the perfect example on that. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> and, and I try and teach my grandchildren this and that. But the biggest thing is respect. Respect for from the child to the parent. But turn that around also. Respect to the child. I mean, yeah. they're, they're learning. You, you know all that stuff. They're learning. Yeah. I, hear, I hear an example of uh, one, one of my granddaughter yelling at her son. You shouldn't do that. Well, he doesn't. Why should I do that? He doesn't know. He just said, don't. So I go and explain to him, listen, this is the reason why. If you yeah. do this, you may injure something. You may hurt yourself. You may be destroying somebody's property. Oh, okay. Yeah. Explain it to him. It's just instead of yelling. Now, for yes. me, that somewhat works. Um, I don't know. But to respect yeah. both things, respect the child, but teach the child respect, not only you, but especially authority right now. Nobody's mm -hmm. expecting authority. Why do I have to do that? Well, it's against the law. Well, who cares? Yeah. So also teach them respect for authority. Yeah. No, I, th I think they're both uh, really good pieces of advice. Well, Frank, thank you so, so much for spending some time with me. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and just uh, from me and for all the listeners, just thank you for everything that you have done and continue to do. This has been fun. Again, I really appreciate it. No, thank you.